Hello again, everybody. It is week five, which means actually we're nearly one half through the summer term since there's 13 weeks. Next week will be just about the halfway point. So we're moving right along. And this week, I want to talk about this idea of coercion through mandates. I don't necessarily like the term coercion. It has a, a very negative connotation. Um, and, it, and it implies really that what that means is that one level of government is forcing another level of government to do something uh, that is undesirable. That is the connotation of the term. I'm not sure that's really what's happening all the time, although some people would maintain it is. But anyway, this week I want to talk about coercion through mandates and talk about a few high points of the readings that I assigned you for this week. So here's what I want to talk about. This, in this outline, I want to talk about the motivation behind coercive mandates, the types of coercive mandates, the responses to coercive mandates, and what I call complicating variables regarding coercive mandates, which I draw from the readings. So, first of all, on the motivation behind mandates, from let's say from the national level government to state and local level governments. Next week, we're going to talk about coercion really from the state level to the local level. But this week we want to talk about the national level to the state and local level. So what's a mandate? Well, this comes partially from the Posner reading and I th uh, added some words myself. But it really is federally induced costs that cause state and local governments to take actions. And I could say in there spend money that they may not have taken on their own initiative given constraints on local budgets. So simply put, it is the national level government telling a state or a locality to do something, something that that level of government might not have done on its own initiative because there are constraints on budgets. So what motivates the central government, that is the federal government, to mandate states to carry out some policy? And we're going to discuss this later, but really, um, I think what motivates the national government to ask or coerce the states to engage in policy actions that the states and localities might not have taken um, are really can be summed up in what I would call and what the books, the readings call nationalizing trends. So we're going to talk about this later, but political parties centralizing um, interest groups growth and transformation, and nationalized media that tend to emphasize national issues. More on that towards the end of the presentation. So the Posner reading talks about, uh, and he draws this greatly from a journal article that he wrote, but um, talks about types of coercive mandates, and he gives several. I'm going to give the list that he shows on page 287 of the text and provide an example uh, for each one. So first he talks about statutory direct order mandates. Um, an example I would give is the Real ID Act as discussed by Reagan and Deering in the 2009 article. So the Real ID Act basically compelled states, told states to change the style uh, and the technology that you use to produce driver's licenses so that they will be more reliable identifications um, in the light of 9-11. That, that's really where the Real ID had its genesis. The second type of mandate is grant conditions. So an example of that is that the original Affordable Care Act law required states to expand Medicaid or risk losing the federal share of Medicaid. That is what the original law said. That happens to be one of the major portions that was invalidated by the Supreme Court in 2012 in a court case uh, that was the National Federation of Independent Businesses versus Sibelius. Um, but that invalidated mandatory Medicaid expansion. So that grant condition was removed. Uh, total statutory preemption is the next one, meaning that state laws are completely preempted by federal laws. Really, preemption from the national level to the state or local level is really covered by what is called the supremacy clause of the constitution 
that says that uh, f federal laws are always of higher precedence than state laws. But that doesn't mean states don't <laughs> fight this. But uh, an example of total statutory preemption was the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which made illegal, specifically made illegal, several state laws restricting voting. Um, so many southern states, in a fairly transparent effort to keep African Americans from voting, applied measures like literacy tests, uh, property requirements, poll taxes, and other requirements. Um, and the Voting Rights Act said those kinds of things are illegal, which basically just preempted all those laws in those states. And then there's partial statutory preemption. So an example of this is that uh, the Obama administration really actually partially preempted state laws, but it also failed to enforce some federal laws. Um, and and I use the example of the Obama administration on its enforcement of federal marijuana laws in Colorado and other states. Basically, that administration said that there would be largely a hands-off policy as long as states had, quote, implemented strong and effective regulatory and enforcement systems to control the cultivation, distribution, sale, and possession of marijuana, consistent with the traditional allocation of federal state efforts in this area. And that was from the Deputy Attorney General, a ruling. Um, now, what's interesting about Colorado and other states that legalized recreational use of marijuana was that the uh, laws governing the, the Controlled Substance Act at the federal level was the Obama administration chose to preempt its own law or the federal law, but banking laws were kept in place. So some of you know this, that, that the marijuana business in Colorado was largely a cash business because uh, for a long time those businesses couldn't uh, deposit money into banks because those banks risked breaking the law and losing their federal charter. And there's about four more that Posner lists. One is federal income tax provisions affecting state and local tax bases. So an example of that is the famous Tax Reform Act that was just passed, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, as it's called, um, which forced some states to rewrite their own tax code. Um, I have, you can click on that link there. Um, you can click on the, on the no narration version of this presentation, and it will take you to this Pew article that talks about actions that states had to take in light of that tax reform bill. In Nebraska, for example, uh, in, during the 2018 session, the unicameral had to pass a new personal exemption credit for people filing 2018 taxes um, because Nebraska's taxes are tied directly, Nebraska's in income tax is tied directly to the federal income tax. And as you know, the the Tax Reform Act of 2017 actually eliminated the pers what is called the personal exemption. So that would have resulted in Nebraska taxpayers paying more tax in Nebraska. So, so Nebraska had to take actions to change its tax code. Several other states, you can look at that Pew article, several other states had to change their tax codes in order not to penalize or unnecessarily reward perhaps taxpayers. Um, then there's regulatory actions by federal agencies or courts. And these are fairly famous, and one of the most famous is court-mandated school integration and busing programs. Uh, so the, inter the desegregation of schools really was a result of Brown versus the Board of Education way back in 1954. But the follow-on to that were several other rulings where in courts mandated integration of school districts and mandated busing programs and actually monitored them. And then there's regu regulatory delays and non-enforcement. So DAC is a great example as an argument over enforcement. So really, the Deferred uh, Action for Childhood Arrivals, the DACA program, which was introduced by the Obama administration, really was a selective enforcement of existing immigration laws. The rationale <laughs> that the Obama administration used was really uh, there are around 
12 million undocumented immigrants in the United States, 10 to 12 million. It's impossible, really. It's a, it's a physical impossibility, probably, to deport everyone, even if that was what the Obama administration wanted to do. It wasn't. The Obama administration did famously deport more uh, undocumented immigrants than even the George W. Bush administration. However, uh, it came up with DACA to say, here's a part of here's a part of the immigration law we won't enforce. These childhood arrivals, we will allow them to gain status in the United States. Now, the Trump administration, of course, has famously said, we need to get rid of DACA. So, um, really, it's an argument over selective enforcement or non-enforcement of existing law. But that could be seen as a mandate from the federal government. And then there's federal exposure of state and local governments to liability lawsuits. Um, the best example of this is uh, Congress allowing, by law, potential lawsuits against state and local governments to motivate compliance. So um, cleanup of environmental sites is one of the areas where this has been used. Um, in other words, the, the federal government has put in laws that states can be sued for by individuals and by others organizations for the cleanup of environmental sites um, and so in order to keep from being sued uh, states will go ahead and work to agree and partner with the federal government to pay to pay shares to clean up sites so these are just some examples that posner uses of mandates and so the important thing about that is there are many ways that the national level government does coerce, if you will, or try to enforce uh, the national level agenda on states, and not all mandates are the same. But having said that, then, what are some responses to coercive mandates? And this is where we I want to explore the other two readings that I gave you, because I think they're really interesting in the way they discuss the responses states have taken to um, try to push back on coercive mandates. And the, the Regan and Deering article, of course, talks about the Real ID Act, the Driver's License Act. Um, here are some of the famous ones, or the most popular ones, actions that states took as they outline in Table 3 of their article. Um, passing laws uh, to state refusal to comply. That is, states would pass laws that said, look, this is the law, we are not going to comply. They just said that. Now, is that legal or not? I don't know. But they passed, several states passed laws that said, dear federal government, we are not going to comply. Several states passed, uh, passed laws in which they implore Congress to repeal the law. Uh, several states passed laws that said they opposed portions which violated existing civil rights and privacy protections that were already enshrined in federal law. Several said they demanded full funding by Congress. In other words, um, it was going to cost money to implement this law, so several states said we'll do it, but only if Congress fully funds it. And there are others. Um, but, what, but what's going on here? Um, and this is what's going on, I think, in the article. One is that there's a philosophical basis, and that is that the national government has overstepped its bounds in demanding a de facto national ID. That is what a lot of states were saying. Uh, you're telling us to change our driver's licenses. What you're really doing is you're demanding a national ID. That's anathema in the United States. We don't use internal passports as in Russia and China. That isn't who the United States is. Um, there's a practical basis, and that is states must upgrade or modify licensing infrastructure. So if you were a state that had the bare bones paper driver's license, um, to modify or upgrade to meet the real ID was going to cost money, obviously, in equipment, in training, in policy. Um, however, the bottom line here is that the real ID law does remain in force, though it hasn't been fully implemented in the time frame that the the law desired initially. I, in your resources for this week, uh, 
I included uh, a website from the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and you can you should look at that to see the status. It's the real-time status of the real ID. See how many states are in compliance and how many states have asked for extensions. Virtually all states have asked for extensions except the ones in compliance. But these extensions are going to run out actually in fall of this year, of 2018. Um, then what happens? And you can read the website and you can see that what happens is, is there's a potential um, that some people to travel within the United States between certain states will need not just a driver's license but a passport. And so that will be the, the fear coming to reality that people will have to have an internal passport. What happens with that law? We're not sure. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, so this is from the Gormley article uh, where he looks at uh, specifically responses in three different policy domain areas. And this is really his hypothetical chart um, that you can see in his article. I, I took this from his article. Um, he's hypothesizing these relationships. So what he says is that uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, unfunded mandates, th that is a number of unfunded mandates. So there can be a low number, a medium number, a high number. So those are kind of subjective, but basically relative to the number of mandates, there are some areas where there's a high level of mandates and some areas where there's a low level of mandates. Um, and then federal financial support. And this is important because not all mandates are unfunded mandates. Some mandates come with a high level of federal support in terms of dollars. So what he's saying is that when there's a high number of mandates with low financial support, you should expect high conflict between the state and federal level. And you go all the way down to the lower right-hand corner where there's a low number of mandates, but with a high financial support, there should be low conflict. And so you can you can uh, take these relationships out um, and fill in all the other blocks with a high level of uh, high number of mandates and a high financial support. You may have s some conflict, but probably not very much. So what he's hypothesizing is that financial support probably makes the big difference in determining whether states actually want to try to push back on mandates or not. And if you read his article, he also discusses this, the style, if you will, of protest that a state may use to push back at the national level government. So here's what he found. And uh, I say this comes with caveats from the study because I think the study has some limitations uh, like as he mentions, the comparability of data, and really low numbers of observations. So this study is really more qualitative, but it does present really some interesting kind of theoretical uh, propositions. So where federal mandates are numerous, and an example of that is environmental policies, what he finds is that federal agencies attempt to placate states with rhetoric. Um, but states aren't always placated, so they end up filing lawsuits often. Um, and because there are very few waivers in environmental policies, the, the best case scenario for states often is uh, a performance partnership with the federal government. What this has the effect of doing is bringing buy-in from the states so they don't feel so victimized by the mandate. Um, but it allows the federal government to back off a little on the mandate and work in partnership with the state. Gormley also talks about education policy, which is characterized by very few mandates. Actually, people don't realize that, but a lot more funding. Um, but often education has been uh, characterized by the granting, the request of, and the granting of waivers. This appears to be a lot more prominent. So for example, Think of the waiver process that went with No Child Left Behind um, and Every Student Succeeds, the, the Bush administration and the Obama administration era programs for K-12 education. 
there was a rigorous, uh, robust kind of waiver apparatus for each of those laws, um, which the states, to greater or lesser extents, took advantage of. Now, what's going to happen now? I'm really not sure. Um, but the waiver process is another way, really, of states uh, attempting to uh, partner with, with the federal government. They ask for waivers basically to say, look, here's what we do in state A, and can we get a waiver to do this program, to tweak the program in this way. Um, Gormley also talks about Medicaid policy, where exceptions and waivers are also more prominent. Um, now, this is one, really, we're going to get into health care in, in a few weeks, really. Um, this, however, is what, to me, made the ACA, the, the Affordable Care Act, kind of surprising. If you recall, if you can actually think back to when the Affordable Care Act was being debated and when it was passed into law during the Obama administration, the federal government actually offered to pay for Medicaid expansion for several years, through about 2019. That actually, curiously enough, was called the Cornhusker Kickback because it was uh, arranged by then Nebraska Senator Ben Nelson. Um, but basically what that provision of the ACA did was it said you are required to, to engage in Medicaid expansion. Again, that's the portion of the law that was later thrown out. But we will pay for your part of the expansion for the next seven years it was at the time. I think. Um, but states still challenge the law in court. So that actually took quite a few people by surprise because they were expecting that most states would say, yes, we will take the federal money through 2019. Uh, and we, in the meantime, we will figure out how to do Medicaid expansion on our own for the future. And that may be through a waiver process. Um, so now what has happened in Medicaid, and again, I think we'll talk about this in a few weeks. Now what has happened with Medicaid is we have sort of an uneven playing field. We have several states that have expanded Medicaid. Several states are still trying to expand Medicaid. Several states that have refused to expand Medicaid. Several states have got exceptions to kind of do their own program in Medicaid. All the while we have still some members of Congress saying they still want to change the Medicaid relationship between the states and the national government. So this is one where I think it really remains to be seen what's going to happen. So the last thing I want to talk about in this presentation, and this comes from all the readings, Posner and other sources, is what are some complicating variables in this whole coercive mandate relationship? And I name four here, but I think these are important. Um, because we we talked about the Federalist Papers, we talked about the Constitution, um, we talked about perhaps what the founders had in mind in terms of the federalism relationship. And some of you wrote in your journals that, you know, maybe they weren't quite sure what they were talking about. And I, I agree with that. I think they were a little bit experimental. But certainly they were talking about a relationship where each sphere had uh, um, a, uh, a set of policy domains that they are responsible for. The states had things they were responsible for. The national government had things it was responsible for. But things have changed. So these four things are complicating. One is the nationalization of the policy agenda, which I mentioned in the first slide. In specific areas, you know, the policy agenda hasn't been nationalized on everything. Uh, the, the national level government doesn't care about parking meters and how much the city of Omaha or the city of Kansas City charges to park downtown. Uh, the, but many things have been nationalized. Education has to an extent been put on the national policy agenda. In fact, we talk about education a lot more than there is money in education in terms of K-12 education. Uh, there is federal money in K-12 education, but the lion's share of the money is still at the state and local level. However, there are some stumbling blocks that people talk about a lot and are 
very upset about or very uh, in favor of uh, on the national agenda, such as Common Core, um, that kind of indicate that education has been nationalized. Really, it's been that way since the 1950s and it's been growing, but again, the money has stayed mostly at the state and local level. Healthcare has certainly been nationalized um, and will continue to, to do so. Welfare reform is another. Homeland security is certainly a, a big area where the policy agenda has been nationalized, especially post 9-11. Now, how does that play out in the relationship, in the federalist relationship between um, the national government and states? Well, one very important area, and those of you in emergency management know this, um, one of the ways that uh, local jurisdictions have been funded for equipment, for training, for other things during the last uh, eight, 17 years since 9-11 has been by justifying the purchase of some kinds of equipment as anti-terrorist kinds of equipment. Uh, so that that national level that nationalization of that part of the policy agenda is important. Um, we know that in terms of emergency response, that is, that is growing as a national level program. Marriage laws. So same-sex marriage wasn't legal a few years ago, um, and the national level government uh, just decades ago was content to let states completely manage and uh, run marriage laws. I mean, before anyone was talking about same-sex marriage, there were states uh, in the South and elsewhere where it was illegal for uh, whites and blacks to marry each other. Um, the federal government, for a couple hundred years, was content to allow states to have those kinds of laws till those laws were overturned. Um, and so, with the um, the Supreme Court decision that uh, that outlawed the Defense of Marriage Act, that declared that unconstitutional, um, really marriage became uh, a nationalized kind of policy issue. And we're still working through some of these things, including the Supreme Court decision the other day that had to do with wedding cakes. So that will continue to be an interesting national policy agenda area. Um, the second thing is the growth of centralization of the two-party system. So for decades, really, um, the the Republican Party and the Democratic Party were really the power base of each of them was at the state and at least the regional level. Um, so the Democratic Party for many decades featured a very powerful Southern or what were called the Dixiecrats faction. So in fact, uh, for example, the the original Social Security law uh, didn't apply to all workers in 1935. In 1935, people who were uh, farm workers and people who were domestic workers could not uh, become eligible for Social Security. Why was that? That was because many blacks in the South were involved in farming and domestic work. And that faction of the Democratic Party would not allow the passage of Social Security <clears throat> if those workers were included. Um, it was this Dixiecrat faction that fought um, civil rights legislation for many years. In fact, um, the so-called Great Society programs of uh, President Johnson in the mid-1960s really was what effectively uh, turned the South from Democratic to Republican over several years. So uh, the parties have become more centralized. There was a time when Northeast, Northeastern Republicans were more liberal than Midwestern colleagues. Um, there was a time when states like Nebraska had conservative Democrats like Senator Exxon, the late Senator Exxon, Senator Ben Nelson. Um, even Bob Kerry was one time a re uh, registered Republican, became a registered Democrat, but he was considered um, a a somewhat moderate Democrat. Now we see really the importance of the central party, both Republican and Democratic, uh, 
Um, and so what that tends to do is that tends to push their agenda interests to, to the central area and away from the states. And then we see the growth of, growth of interest groups with national agendas. So interest groups have exploded in the last 40 years or so, um, grown way beyond business interests, which had typically focused at the state level. And so groups like environmental groups typically, typically have a national agenda. The NRA certainly has a national agenda. Uh, we've seen the growth of groups like ALEC, which is uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is an ex a conservative group that provides state legislators with ready-made bills to propose. Um, finally, we've seen simultaneous and rapid changes in the press. So the First Amendment, of course, guarantees the freedom of the press. Um, now, the press, as it existed in 1787, was really literally a few people who owned printing presses, who printed their pamphlets, which they or their friends probably wrote, or newspapers in which they or their friends wrote articles. Um, but now we have the growth of national media, both commercial and public. Uh, we have seen the demise of the newspaper industry, which has hit local newspapers, especially in small town America, very hard. So the newspaper industry is going downhill in large cities. It's certainly going downhill in small towns and may not even exist anymore. Um, meaning really that local news doesn't have the importance that it once did. Uh, and we've seen an exponential growth of social media with the attendant suspicion of the veracity of some of the sources in social media. And so all of these variables seem to complicate and centralize our view of what constitutes policy. And so when our policy interests become more nationalized, well, then there is more pressure for the central government to, to push its policy on to state level governments. So, therefore, <laughs> this is how I always end, I know, but therefore, um, what do you think about this? Uh, here's what I want to do this week for group for discussions. I want to, I'm going to let Canvas um, put you into random groups again this week, two groups, and I've proposed uh, two different questions. Um, and you can see them there. Group one, I'm asking you to choose a specific policy domain. It doesn't have to be one of these ones we've talked about. Um, and discuss the implications of the nationalization of the policy agenda for this domain and the implications for state and local governments. Just, I want you to discuss that. And then for group two, I want you to discuss whether you think a defense of federalism is a guise for partisan motives on the parts of states and local governments. That is, many states and local governments, as we saw in the Real ID article, pushed back on the Real ID because they said this violates the tenets of federalism. Well, was that just something um, used as a cover for partisan motives? I don't know. I think it is possible, as I say in the note, that it's that states might simultaneously defend federalism in a principled manner while holding partisan viewpoints. But what I'd like you to do is pick a policy domain and talk about whether a defense of federalism is is a actually a hidden uh, or veiled defense of partisan motives. In each case, in each group, I'd like you to respond to each other within your group. So that's where we're at for this week. Uh, once again, please take my lecture as supplemental to the readings, not as replacing the readings, and I look forward to your discussions. Thank you.